Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? What does it mean to live courageously? To show up even when things are hard. I'm so delighted to share today's conversation with a dear friend, Kristen Escavias, where we talked about what it means to live with courage, authenticity, and grit. Kristen is an executive and personal coach, supporting individuals to reach their next level of success in their careers and beyond. Clients often seek Kristen's support at times of change, expanding responsibilities, seeking a new position, pivoting careers, or wanting something to shift, but uncertain of where or how to start. She helps her clients connect to an authentic path forward, one aligned with what matters to that person, and discover new possibilities to achieve their goals. Kristen's coaching experience ranges from corporate clients to entrepreneurs, emerging leaders to seasoned managers and C-suite executives, and spanning across functions, departments, and industries. She brings all of her experiences as a corporate leader, yoga teacher, mom of two, committed student of personal growth and leadership development into her coaching work to create trust, connection, and empathy. She's grateful to get to do this purposeful work in the world and make an impact in others' lives, one conversation at a time. In today's episode, Kristen shares the ABC method approach where she goes from hyper-reactive to being more mindful and present. Her relationship with her grandfather and how it inspired her to find what she's passionate about. The importance of pausing and celebrating how far you've gone and where you're at. How she connects to her inner compassion when the self-critique gets too loud. And how she incorporates the Enneagram system frameworks to support her clients. Come grab a drink, get cozy, and join our conversation. Welcome, Kristen. I am so honored to have you here today. And I already know we're going to have a very nourishing one hour conversation. Mm. So I look forward to it. You're a certified coach, facilitator, speaker, yogi, and mom. You're also the founder of Courageous Growth, where you support individuals, teams, and organizations to reach next level success. Tell me more about you. (laughs) Oh my gosh, where to start? (laughs) Yeah. I could say so many things, but, you know, I have just been on this journey the last five years of really, what does it mean to live with courage, to live from a place of authenticity, to live with a sense of freedom and alignment with your own truth. And so those are the types of things that I use to like guide me and what I do and how I do my work and how I live my life. So I am so grateful for the work that I get to do as a coach and working with individuals and supporting them to really find that empowerment to be at choice with their life. Um, I work in the yoga space. It's just like, oh, so much fun. And I am so honored to get to share my love and passion for yoga with folks and my little sweet babies. My daughter is eight. My son is six. And so they just, they help keep me grounded and like really challenge me to to practice what I preach and staying present in the moment to enjoy time because, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've been a mom for eight years. It's wild (laughs) how fast time goes. Yeah, but I'm so excited to be here with you and have this conversation today. So thank you for having me. I love how you started with the past five years, you've been asking yourself these questions on courage and alignment and growth. And those are They sound simple on the surface, but they can be really, really challenging. Yes. What led you to, I guess, go down that path of exploring and diving deeper? Mm. 
you know, five years ago, my grandfather passed away and he was the most inspirational person in my life, such a key influence growing up for me. And right around that time, it was kind of like, what do I really want to be doing? And I, at the same time, a good friend of mine had given me this book recommendation for Grit by Angela Duckworth. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go read this book. And 40 pages in, I get to her formula of what is grit. And she talks about, it's the combination of passion and perseverance. And I was like, I got the perseverance thing down, (laughs) but what am I really passionate about? Like, I loved my job and I loved, like, I, I had so many great things that I was grateful for in my life and had achieved really amazing success in my career. And on the surface, like everything was really good, but I was like, what am I, what's my passion? And I looked at like the way my grandfather lived his life and the impact that he had and how he touched so many people's lives, like unbelievable to see the amount of people that had just come to pay their respects at his um, celebrations of life. But I was like, I don't know what that thing is, but that was like the Mm. spark of there's something more that I want for my life and for myself and for what my contribution is to the world. And so it's really been this journey of like, okay, well, what is that thing? Um, and so it's been a, it's been a lot of soul searching. Uh, but I feel like I've arrived at that place and I'm, it's, it's taken a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of courage, but I feel like I've arrived and I've had a lot of really great teachers to help me along the way. What does it mean to be there, to arrive? Does it mean you don't, you know, have goals or anything? Like, how do you find the balance between wanting to accomplish all the things you have for yourself and being okay with where you're at? Because that's what it sounds like. Mm. It's so funny you asked that because like three weeks ago, I was just talking with an old coach of mine and... She was like, Kristen, you have worked so hard to get to where you are with your business. Can you just give yourself permission to enjoy the fruits of your labor and like let yourself really be where you are and know that this is a really great place to be and and trusting yourself that you're never going to give up on those things that you want. Like, oh my gosh, I want to do a million things. (laughs) Yeah, so many ideas, but can I just be here and like enjoy it and not have to go and do? And I've I've got like a strong achiever in me and a perfectionist in me and a doer, like a lot of women and people that I think you have said are listening to this podcast. <laughs> um, and it's something that I practice with my clients too. Of like, we're so caught up in like, what's the next thing to do? And that's a big part of our culture too. Is like go, 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 do, 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 that giving my clients even the space to celebrate and look back and what a, look at how far I've come. Look at how Mm. much I've accomplished. Look at how I've changed. Look at who I'm being now and like relish in that. So I'm giving myself really this, a lot of space and permission this summer through the summer to just like enjoy where I am and knowing that I don't have to do anything more than what I'm already doing. And I'm doing a lot. So this is enough. Yeah, let that be enough. Uh, You're so right about always looking forward. And I my background was in advertising, and everything we did was due yesterday. So we never, we were never able to catch up. And we were constantly behind. And this mentality and culture you can see it everywhere like the fear of missing out and you're always just trying to catch it with the latest social trends it's so exhausting to live that way but when I think we briefly talked about like just looking past at the uh, looking back at the past couple of months and realizing oh I've done I've accomplished all these things I wanted to do I just need to enjoy it instead of Mm -hmm. keep looking forward and just you know I accomplish it and keep like skipping the rocks Mm -hmm. and missing Mm -hmm. it completely Yeah. I mean, it's like that cliche. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Yeah. And yes. And like giving yourself, like when you're on a journey, you or a road trip, like you take many stops along the way. And so just knowing that the journey is never done, but 
but I'm just going to take a little rest stop right here and like take in the view and let it like sink in and let it integrate. Like sometimes we also like, I'm a big, um, personal growth junkie. Like, oh my God, I'm reading like five books right now. <laughs> at the same time. I love my books. Yeah. And I have some clients that I've been working with too, for probably a couple of years. And they're like, okay, so what's the next thing to learn? And, and sometimes that's just, there's nothing that you need to learn or do. It's allowing like all that you've experienced to integrate and to settle and to marinate and to soak up and really just embrace that season of change that you just went through. Mm. And pause. Yes. Yes. And like, I think we often like to skip over, I call it the digestion period because mm-hmm. you learn, well, the way I used to function, is like, I learned something, I understand that's my habit. And then I go into the doing, but then it takes time to digest. And then for you to fully embody those changes or whoever mm-hmm. you're trying to become or unbecome. And that's, yeah. I think that's kind of like a special incubation period <laughs> that we often try to skip. Yeah. And I admit it a lot of times. I want to skip it. I just like, I just want to be better. I just want to be healthy. Like I don't want to be incubated there, but we have to. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I love that word incubation period. It's like, you know, there's so many books that, I mean, I'm I'm not going to go on and on about my books, but like (laughs) you read the book and then we, we know it, but just because we know it, it doesn't mean we do it or it's part of us. I mean, I've been practicing yoga for so long and teaching yoga and teaching mindfulness and meditation and and different spaces. And, and sometimes it's like, I'm teaching from a place of deep, my deep practice, but because I still am so committed to it, I feel like each season brings this new layer of learning and integration of even just the practice itself. Like, what does it truly mean to be mindful? Like in this moment, can you feel your back on the chair? Do you feel your feet on the ground? Do you feel like the touch of the shirt on your sleeve? Do you feel your hair kind of resting on your neck and your glasses on your face and the temperature of the room and any taste lingering in your mouth from what you've consumed that day? Like to really be that present. That was so powerful as you were just like naming all the items. I'm like, yeah, I feel more present and grounded just, and it doesn't take a lot. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take like an hour of meditation because I think so often me included in the past, I was like, if I can't do an hour of yoga, then I won't do it (laughs) because then I feel this immense dread. And when the thing that used to light me up starts becoming a dread, I know that there's something either in my mindset or resistance, or it's like, ah, this is becoming a task. This is supposed to be enjoyable, but I'm not making it enjoyable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Like we're like, we're so fixated on how all the things need to be for, for that thing to be exactly what we want from it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I wanted to, oh, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. (laughs) I was going to say that happened to me with like yoga and COVID because I wasn't going to a studio. I was so distracted at home. And so I just put my practice on the shelf for a little while because I couldn't, I just like, wasn't able to create the circumstances I wanted to get the type of practice I wanted and what I needed out of it. And so trying to find other ways to fulfill that need, but even like meditation, like it's really hard to meditate when you have kids running around and people co-working in the same space with you. And so, okay, then how can you just step outside for five minutes? And that's enough. Like what's enough to really get the thing that you need from that without it having to be this like ideal, perfect situation and set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was going to be my next question about how do you know that it's enough for you? How are you? how do you work through if you don't feel okay with the present? Mm. I've been practicing something that I've been, I've been preaching about for a long time. I don't necessarily say I would always practice it, but I've been doing it a lot more lately. And it's the super, super simple approach. It's called the ABC method. And 
A is for awareness, B is for breathe, and C is for choose. So when I feel myself in a hyper-reactive place, and to be honest, a lot of times it comes if like I get really stressed out or triggered by something, like my kids will, they're like 99% of the time best friends, but that 1% of the time, like all of a sudden I hear like one of them is running, like their life depends on it or something. (laughs) And then I'm like, what's happening? And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'll tell them you guys go sit down and then I go stand like a little bit away. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take, I'm like, oh, I caught myself. I was aware of my reactiveness. I'm going to take three deep breaths. And that takes you like the neuroscience is it takes you out of the fight flight part of your brain into the middle part, the mammalian part of your brain. And then the C is choose, like choose gratitude, grateful that you noticed and you did something and you gave yourself a moment to pause or choose. Okay. How do I want to show up? Like I've really been practicing. I want to show up as a loving, compassionate, patient mom. So how can I, I'm just going to go back and talk to them. And how can I give them both some love and compassion? Okay, what's your side? What's your side? And be patient with these cute little six and eight-year-old minds who are like, they're just, it's usually pretty innocent. And it can be quite comical if you like actually get them talking about it. So it's it's just kind of letting myself, so that's like one practical way that I, I do it. But then also I was kind of hard on myself that I wasn't practicing yoga last year. And I mean, I'm a yoga teacher. I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm not even practicing, but it just really wasn't what I needed. And so Mm -hmm. I found other things that worked. And for me, it was getting outside, just going on a 20 minute walk, a 10 minute walk, sometimes an hour and a half walk. I found Mm -hmm. this sweet loop that I could do that has a bench and it overlooks a little pond and some hills. And I'd sit there and I'd do my meditation And so that was nurturing at the time. And so it's like, it's fine something, but then don't cling on to it so much that that's the only way it can be or the way it has to be. And that's the way it is forever because we're, we're humans, we're constantly changing. And so just giving yourself permission to adapt and change and try new things also. Mm. Yes. Amen. Thank you for sharing these tips. <laughs> I could preach about it all the time, especially I love the the ABC because it really pulls you out of the reacting, but also it acknowledges what you're feeling. Yeah. Cause you might be frustrated and so many of us react first and then regret later. And you know, we don't <laughs> want to be in regret ever. So having that moment of awareness and then breathing to ground yourself and then, okay, how can I show up? You can still be frustrated. Yeah. But then you have another tool, like you said, like habits that you can adapt to and choose because you can have certain tools that used to work, but what if today you need something else? And I think that flexibility is so important that now that I'm older, I'm able to embrace it. But back in the day, I don't know why I I was so strict with myself. I have to work out an hour every day. I have to do (laughs) 10,000 steps. And those were things that were supposed to serve me until they stressed me out. And maybe for a a period of time, it did work, right? So also just like being kind to yourself to say, you know, that was the best that I knew then. Yeah. And, And it worked until it, or maybe it didn't work, but at least you were trying something. And that's like a big part of it too, of just trying, like you don't really know until you try. Mm -hmm. And, and part of it, like what I'm like noticing about myself here is I don't want to like give the impression that I've got it all figured out. And I'm so like aware and in control and self-managing all the time. I'm crazy sometimes too. (laughs) And so And really, really hard on myself. And so also in in like, I just want to bring in my own humanness. Like we don't, we're not always doing like what we would think is our best self or like how we could always want to be, should be. And so it's like, even in those moments when, yeah, I totally lost my cool on my kids or something at the end of the day, just like saying, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You're doing the best you can acknowledge. Maybe I was having a hard day. 
maybe something else was going on. Maybe I didn't sleep well. Maybe I, something, you know, and just giving yourself a bit of self-compassion and like calming that inner critic and that Mm -hmm. judgy voice that's like, you're not a good mom or you didn't, you're not a good yogi. You didn't get on your mat today or whatever the thing is that you should be doing or should be doing better. Like just giving yourself credit for, hey, you made it through the day. And sometimes that's all that's needed. Yeah, that's so true. How do you connect to that part of yourself, that inner compassion? Oh my gosh, I have been practicing a lot. Um, One, I have amazing source of like really, really great people that can remind me when my inner judginess gets really hot and heavy and I'm like being hard on myself. Like I have a few good people in my life that I can rely on and call and just vent. And sometimes you just need to get it, get it out. Yeah. And then they remind me like, you're an amazing mom. You're an amazing person. You have the biggest heart. You're making like, and they reinforce some things to me. So it's so important to have that network that love that support and that community to uplift you and 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 to hold you when you're just like having a moment or having a day or a season Mm. um but then also something that I really have been doing a lot of is journaling and I just like to get all that out on paper and when I'm noticing I'm like really really stuck in like a lot of self-criticism or doubt ending that journaling with a gratitude. Like anytime you can come back to gratitude, it there's like almost no room for that self-critique to take over. Like your, your inner critic is really just trying to come in and keep you safe. Mm-hmm. And like, and sometimes safe means stuck in the same patterns that you're in, whether or not they're actually like productive or healthy or good or the ones that you want to be in, but they're safe in the sense that they're predictable. And that you, you know, like your inner critic knows where it's going to take you. But if it's not the way that you want to be, or if it's causing you something other than what you want for yourself or in your life, then it's starting to just gain awareness of when does that voice show up? What triggers it? What does it say? What are its mean shame messages? Mm -hmm. And as you build that awareness, then you're able to start recognizing it and quieting it faster. So as you, you can quiet it. So it's not, doesn't show up as frequently when it does show up, it's not as loud or as intense and it doesn't last as long. And that's the practice of Mm self-compassion. That was beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just like, yes, yes, like nodding my head. It's so true because I think so often we we might be, you know, depending on, you might be a people pleaser or a helper. Like my, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about the Enneagram system. I know that I'm type two, which is the helper. And mm-hmm. I used to overextend myself and help everyone. And then when it came to myself, I would be a bit more harsh more yeah. you know my inner critique was louder because it's so easy to spiral in your own mind in your own thoughts yeah. so it really helps like you said to have a network of people or even a coach or someone you can talk to that will call you out for it but also hold you in a safe space to vent mm. mm-hmm. yeah so thank yeah. you for sharing that yeah I've, I'm so grateful I've had a handful of like amazing coaches and therapists in my life that have really helped me to do a lot of that inner work. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, I think a, a practice it's not, you're never done. Um, <laughs> and it's something that you need to keep practicing and it's courageous. It's scary. And so finding someone that you really connect with that can, like you said, hold you safely and lovingly and also help you like see yourself in a mirror And then see what else is possible and just keeping you accountable to doing that work Mm -hmm. and finding something that works for you. Like I've got a whole long list of self-compassion exercises and you could read books about it and it's all over Instagram and, you know, but until you really practice it, you're not going to find something that works for you. And so it's just being willing and committed to 
to practicing it. Yeah. And I think part of the practice is that you might be triggered or you'll be very uncomfortable because you're aware of it now. So, <laughs> so now you have to kind of like, okay, this is when these tools matter the most. When you put them in practice, when you're in a position where, oh, I hate everything. <laughs> I feel so stressed out. That's when the tools matter the most. Because when you're happy, of course, you're going to find gratitude in a second. Yeah. But when you're not that's when they matter the most. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Oh. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your business, Courage Growth. Tell me what you do. Who do you work with? Oh, I love the work I get to do. Um, so I work with a lot of the folks that come to me. They're pretty successful in their careers and there's something that they want more of or something different. And so they're recognizing that they have great success in their life, but there's just, oftentimes it starts with wanting something different at work. So mm -hmm. I've gotten a new promotion or I want a promotion or I want a new job. And so that's kind of their entry in. And through our work together, they gain this deep sense of self-awareness and what are the things that they're telling themselves that are getting in the way? Mm -hmm. So whether that's, ooh, I really don't like confrontation. And so I can't tell people on my team when they're not doing a good job, or I don't know how to stand up for myself and push back, or I'm actually just, I want something more and different. I want a new job. I want to explore a new industry. And so through that exploration, what's so fascinating is career is often the entry but what ends up happening is we look at, you know, I really like to focus on the whole person. And so where, where we, how we show up in one place is oftentimes how we show up in all Everyone. places. Yeah. And so our work really starts from a foundation of getting to know, like, what are your core values? What really matters to you and how aligned are you to those values in different aspects of your life? And then from there, what do you want to be different? What changes are you hoping? And who do you want to be? How do you, I love asking people like, how do you want people to describe you? How do you want to be known? Mm -hmm. And then where are you, where are you out of alignment? And what would it be like to live, to be that person, to stretch yourself, to be that person? And so the type of change that ends up happening and the type of results that people gain are all over the place. But ultimately, I think what happens is people gain a deeper sense of self-awareness, which helps them grow their confidence. And they recognize, I actually have the power to be at choice. Instead of doing things every, the way that everybody tells me I should do, or what the definition of like a good leader is, it's much more from a place of, oh, this is my authentic way of showing up. And there's lots of ways that are right. So what's the right way for me, whether that's in relationships, whether that's in my career, whether that's in hobbies and passions that I pursue or finances or the space that I live in, like everything and anything gets to be part of that because it's, what's the life that you want to live where you feel fulfilled and alive and excited to wake up every day? Like, that's what I want for my clients. Yeah. Oh. I feel excited just hearing about that <laughs> because I think when we do the work, we realize how much of the things that happen around us is, doesn't define who we are. And so often we get trapped in this autopilot, you know, milestone society expectations and we follow this until, you know, we realize it's not for us and it's daunting to think who am I? I know that being authentic is the thing is <laughs> what, you know, it's the most important thing, but how do I access that part of myself? Yeah. And I love how you share about asking those questions and really giving space to explore and to even daydream about mm. it. Yeah. The simplest question is like, what do you want? Hard question to <laughs> everything. <laughs> I mean, I remember my first coach was like, okay, if you could change five things, what would you change? Like, what do you really want? And I was like, I could only name two. I was so out of touch. And so 
that's just part of that exploratory nature of the work too, is helping to come back to yourself to figure out when I quiet all the voices of what my boss thinks I should do and what my company thinks is good and what my parents think are the things I should do and what success looks like, or just the image that I have based on whatever influences are coming in and instead think about what do I want to be about in the world? And if I live from that place, then what are the types of things I get to do? Mm -hmm. And it's such a more liberating, peaceful way to like design and go about your life rather than I want this job title and this earning and this city and this type of house and, and, the, and like the list. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, it's like, I just want it to be more, e like I want it to be easy. I don't want it to be the weight of like, oh, this is, this is how it should be. Just, mm -hmm. it's not, that's not authentic for me. Yeah. And it's more, align to how it feels for you as opposed to like you said the list <laughs> of what yeah. everybody should be doing oh it's so powerful and I love I had some resistance towards coaching at the beginning because I I thought it was about you know being the authority figure telling people what to do having to figure everything <laughs> out but the more and more I talk with other coaches I realized no it's just really about embracing these parts of you and guiding and mm. you initially shared a little bit um, when we talked a few weeks back about how coaching found you. You didn't intend to coach or anything like that. <laughs> Can you share how that happened? Yeah, I honestly didn't even know what coaching was. <laughs> I was I was working with Sephora in the corporate headquarters, leading an analytics and strategy team, and got to be part of this pilot program for high potential leaders. And part of that program was having a coach. And it was just this great opportunity that I didn't even know what exactly I was getting out of the opportunity. I just knew it was really great. And so I kind of went in like eyes wide open. I'm, I'm all in, but I don't even know what I'm all in for, but I'm all in. And so as I was working with my coach and starting to uncover some of the things that really mattered to me, I mean, in our first session, he said, if you want a fulfilling life, you live a fulfilling life is one where you live in alignment with your values. And I was like, <laughs> what? Is that simple? And I had never, I was just, I was like, I was blown away. And so through my work with him, really getting in tune with, oh, well, what, what are the things that are really important to me? And what would it be to like, design and align my life to that. And at the time I was really, really happy with my job. I had this amazing team, great boss. I love my company. Like things were really great work-wise. And so I wasn't really like, oh, I need a new job, but there was something that inside of me that was like wanting something with a little bit more deeper purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I just started coming up with like all sorts of ideas. Like well, I want to take a photography class because I want more creativity in my life. And maybe I'll go be a yoga teacher. I love yoga. I don't know. Like he, I love developing people. Like I put so much pride in the way I led teams and promoted people and fostered like really strong relationships in the organization and just love people. He's like, well, maybe coaching. And I was like, okay. And so I just put up all these ideas on a vision board and said, all right, well, where are we going to start? Yeah. So I ended up doing a yoga teacher training actually first and loved that, which is like a whole nother conversation, maybe part of this conversation. <laughs> um, and then through that, I was like, okay, I want to start teaching, but I don't think that's the thing. And so then I said, I'm just going to go take a coaching class. And if nothing else, it'll help give me a new set of skills to be a better leader. And so I did a class, it was two and a half days. It's like two and a half days, nothing really to lose, so much to gain. And I loved it. Mm. I loved it. And so I kept going through the training program and about halfway through the program was able to work with my leader and my HR partners to start coaching internally in my organization. 
And then as I started gaining momentum and doing that more and more, just realized like, this is what I really love doing. Like, Mm -hmm. I love to be with people. It's such an honor when this, it's a sacred, special space where all the walls come down, sometimes slowly, sometimes fast. And people really let me in to their heart, to their truth, to their like most vulnerable places that they're like nervous and scared to give voice to. Mm -hmm. And we do the sacred, meaningful work where they get to know themselves better and really create this vision for their life and tackle the things that they're scared of, whether that's a conversation with somebody or pursuing a dream or even just naming a dream. Mm -hmm. It's profound. It's beautiful. It's so sweet. And it's making, it makes a difference in the world. If more people are really living with truth and authenticity and courage and aliveness and joy and like not from that place of shoulds and fear and hesitation. I just imagine like what that ripple effect would be and is. I want to live in a world like that. (laughs) And I know we're moving towards there, hopefully. Are you ready to create space for ease and alignment? I've created a free starter guide to help you go from frazzle to focus. It's a guide for the overwhelmed go-getter who's eager to find more ease, clarity, and alignment in their lives, so you can quiet the noise and strengthen your connection within. After all, we can't align what we don't know is misaligned. Simply grab your free copy at wholeandunleashed.com slash guide. I really appreciate you sharing how when you found coaching, it wasn't like your life was crumbling and, you know, things weren't working out because oftentimes when I look back at when I transitioned my career, I wasn't really in a place where things were falling apart. Like I wasn't the healthiest. I just knew I was out of balance and I knew that I followed that inkling because there was something more. And it's so important, I think, to really honor that feeling that wants to pull you into Mm. trying something out. And it's Mm -hmm. scary because it can ask you to maybe walk out of a career, relationships, or move somewhere else. It could do all those things. But I think honoring that voice, there's a beauty, just like the way that you describe it, of how everything kind of just flowed. You followed it seems, well, it seems like that there was definitely a lot of trials and tribulations along the way, but I'm curious for you, like, how do you tap into, how do you discover, how do you listen to your inner voice? Ooh, there's like so many layers to it, but now that I've practiced more, it's slowing down Mm. and really asking myself, is this for me? because I've done so many things and in a way I feel like all my experiences were exactly what I needed to do to lead me here I had to I I had to go through multiple burnouts I had to because if I hadn't seen that world I wouldn't be able to come back and guide it and want to make a difference I would just be like oh if I went straight into coaching no way (laughs) I don't think I would have that set of skills but because I can only guide when I've lived through it. Mm. It's so much more powerful. That's Mm. why I appreciated your story because the steps that takes us to where we are, I don't regret any of it. And I think it's important that even if you're pivoting in your career or in whatever stage you're at, maybe it worked in the past. Maybe that was exactly what you needed. The people you meet in your life, friendships, maybe that was exactly what you needed. But now time to go other ways and I think we try to hold on to the forever like a friend from like childhood but you grow apart and just the same with your careers and places you live and it's yeah really okay to start you know just okay my pull is going somewhere else Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that it's just the freedom to say here's what I want or here's what I have an inkling for right now and I'm gonna dare to follow that and take it where it takes me for however long it takes me there until yeah. maybe something new emerges and letting that be okay. Ooh. Yeah. And it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't mean it's not, 
you don't get the ups and downs like we have the tools but I still have days where I'm like oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is so stressful I don't know what to do with my life we still get those because we're human yes it's so totally. important to acknowledge that we might not share it all the time because it's not Instagram worthy yeah you know it if it feels right do it but yeah acknowledging that it's yeah yeah, yeah. I really appreciate um what you had to say about looking at your past and how that has helped you be in service of the people that you're working with. And I a hundred percent agree. I was, I was meeting with a client this morning even, and she has so much pressure that she's putting on herself with her work. And she has two young kids and she's like, I just don't feel like I'm doing my best anywhere. And I could just so relate to that feeling like never, it was never quite enough, but I was giving more than I even had to give. And so just being able to acknowledge her experience and normalize it and just let people know you're not the only one. Because these are like, these are really dark places and fears and shame and guilt can like really cloud over us in those moments and we don't talk about that enough Mm -hmm. and we want to have our stuff all together all the time and we don't want to let people see really like we're not really keeping it together (laughs) as well as everybody thinks we're keeping it together and Part of what I love about also some of the other work I do is it is work in groups. And I'm just thinking about a group I was facilitating. It was like two years ago now because it was pre-COVID. But there was a woman who was maybe 20 and then another woman who was in her 60s. And they were both having a very, very similar challenge. Mm -hmm. And it was so sweet because they were like, they both acknowledged each other and saying, it made me feel, the 20 year olds like, it made me feel so good to know that stuff that I'm struggling with, someone three times my age is also struggling with and that we are all struggling with something. And so just having that shared experience to recognize our common humanity and that we all struggle and that we are not ever alone. And no one has it all together and all figured out. Yeah. It's so profound. It's, I, I'm so grateful you brought this up because we met at a mastermind. And that was, for me, the final part of like, I guess, coaching that helped me really come to myself because it wasn't, I think one-on-one would have helped me, but I had to be around other people. I, I wanted to recognize myself in others and also you know, be seen and hold space. And it's so Mm. powerful because we're a community. And just, that's why I think, you know, social media has taken off so much because we want to connect to others. We want to, and, you know, anything can be good or bad depending on how you consume it. But I think the need for connection is happening regardless if we are aware of it or not. We're humans. We Mm. just want to be validated. We want someone to tell us it sucks. You know, nobody's going to solve anything for you, but we just want to be heard and seen and know that we're not alone. Because when we're going through those darkest places, we think we're the only one because we're so consumed by, you know, the pain and discomfort. Yeah. And we allow ourselves to stay in those painful parts. Yeah. I was thinking about it this morning. I was like, why do we stay in our pity party? But we don't allow ourselves to relish in the joy. Mm. What came up? Well, I was thinking about a couple years, like early in my coaching business, I um, would do, I do sample sessions with clients. So I'll meet with somebody and chance for us to feel each other out. Like, do you like me and how I am? And are you a type of client that I think I can serve and help and be with? And are we a good match for each other? And at the beginning, when I was 
had just left my corporate job and I was starting a business. I'm like, I need clients. (laughs) Who wants me? Who wants me? (laughs) Um, Come a long way. But um, I remember like getting turned down from this client that I thought we had a really, really great connection. And I was, had just gotten in my car after I had seen the email and I said, okay, I'm going to allow myself for the next 10 minutes while I'm driving to have a pity party because I just, you have to feel it. And then I'm going to re I'm going to be done. So I gave myself permission to go there. And I was like, man, how did you mess that up? What did you say? Were you trying too hard? Were you too aggressive? Were you not aggressive enough? Like all the things. (laughs) Right. Right. And then I got to where I was going and I was like, okay, well, that's done. That just wasn't meant to be. And I know something new is coming, so I'm okay. So I just let it exist and let it out. And then I had such a great weekend this weekend. It was like in the 80s, the sun was shining. I got to, I was in a a workshop on Saturday that was just all about self-compassion. So it was filled me up. And then I spent time with like really good friends and my sister and sunshine. And oh my, it was just live music for like the first time in a long, I was so filled up. And how quickly we're like, oh, back to work or, you know, on to the next thing. And I was like, I'm just going to really ride the high of the joy that I feel. And like, just let it seep into my week and keep bringing back memories and moments and looking at pictures and like, just, it's still like, I'm still so full from it. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I can totally relate. And I think I remember reading something about Brene Brown that was like tragedy dress rehearsal or something where you don't allow yourself experience joy because you're afraid that it won't last. Mm-hmm. And I can't, it, you know, I never knew that's how I was because something great would happen. And then I'll tell myself like, don't believe it too much or don't, don't feel that joy because it will be taken care, taken away from you. And even if that's true, why shouldn't we like, relinquish every second of it yeah yeah like that I think she calls it like foreboding joy or something where it's like it's good but don't get too comfortable because it's not going to last forever yeah and honestly I think something that I um something that I really really believe is the depths to which we're willing to experience any emotion expands our capacity to feel all emotion. Can you repeat that? (laughs) So the depths to which we are allow ourselves to feel any emotion. So whether that's joy, pain, anger, contentment, it expands our capacity to feel it all. Mm. So the more you're willing to let yourself like sit in the discomfort expands your capacity to enjoy the comfort. And I, I don't want to say like the good versus the bad, because I don't necessarily like to even label our emotions. Our emotions are emotions. That's part of being human. Exactly. But I remember this, this moment is probably two and a half years ago. And I was in, um, like around December and a dear family friend, uh, a family member was diagnosed with um, something and had just started treatment. And I just was really overcome with so much sadness and worry and overwhelmed with tears, seeing the picture of this person, like in getting their treatment. And at the same time, it was maybe a month after I left my job, my corporate job, and was starting my business. And I was in this week-long training, yoga training with like one of my best friends and was starting to like really feel like the decompression of having left my corporate life and like settling into this new way of being and feeling so immensely grateful and like this deep purpose that I've been longing for and freedom in a new way and holding them both 
at the same time and feeling like feeling the the true presence of such heartache and sorrow and sadness and immense joy and gratitude and that moment always just sticks out to me as a, a reminder like we are not one thing we are not just happy or sad or life isn't just good or bad and or busy but as a human we have so much capacity to experience and feel so many things and so just finding ways to really connect in with that and feel those like really really feel them yeah Ooh. and one doesn't outweigh the other no yeah oh you reminded me of a similar experience a couple of weeks ago i i felt like an extreme happiness and also grief like a family member passed away and i i think if i hadn't done this work i wouldn't be able to hold both i was able to f- hold these both emotions and it none of them outweigh the other mm-hmm. and i could feel the grief and also the beauty of what had just happened and well granted that by the end of the day i was exhausted like physically <laughs> exhausted because I you bet. know those are extreme emotions yeah you know it was like this excitement of something that i was looking forward to and then this just sadness and then i took a bath and i for the next couple of days i was like pretty slow and knocked out Mm-hmm. but it felt good to not push it down or to think you know i'm going to feel happy or i don't deserve this happiness i'm just going to feel sadness and i think a lot of times we think you can't feel all these ranges of emotions yeah or even giving yourself permission just to tap into one of them mm-hmm. like i don't know about for you but for me personally i don't know that i saw emotions modeled meaning do we allow ourselves to really healthy healthily healthy what I don't know what the word is <laughs> have a healthy expression of sadness or of anger or of pure joy are those things ever like are they modeled for us that we even know what they are like i read this article and it said i might mess this up so that's okay but something like a poll was done and they asked people what they feel or how many emotions could they name and it was something they're like 3 to 6 emotions and there's so many diff- there's so many there's such a wide range of things that we have capacity to feel mm. but we're so out of touch with ourselves that oftentimes and we're moving so quickly that we don't even know what we're feeling, let alone Ooh. holding two things at once. You're like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> it's so true. So I, I've shared this a little bit about how like I started getting in touch with my emotions just recently, a couple of years ago, um, because like, you know, my sister and my husband, they were providing like a very safe space for me to feel and they care for it. Mm. And then therapy, my therapist was like, you know, you're a happy person. Great. But you need to feel grief. You need to feel anger. I'm like, I don't have any. (laughs) And she helped me tapped into that. And when that happened, I felt like, you know, a part of me that was always sensitive that I suppressed because I was told you're too sensitive, don't feel. And we're also, I think, taught to move away from uncomfortable emotions, maybe because the people around you don't have the capacity because they don't know how to feel them or how to acknowledge them yeah so they're like well if you're feeling sad we can't solve it so they think it's to be solved yeah so yeah so learning that and holding space for them it's been so transformational so thank you for bringing that up what has it what's the gift of it that it's brought into your life because it's great that you can do it but what does it give you and what do you love about it I think just being able to feel and the thing that I learned is that feelings are data or like it tells you like when you're feeling sad or anxious it tells you your body your mind is trying to tell you what's happening so Mm. when you consciously try to push away the discomfortable discomfortable uncomfortable feeling (laughs) then (laughs) you're going to think that everything's okay you're going to be running with your mind instead of connecting to your body and how you're doing yeah yeah 
Mm. So important. Oh gosh, Out I could autopilot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think it might be scary at first because you don't know how to do it, but you can start with someone to hold you space or a friend and mm-hmm. understand self-awareness. I think it all starts with self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh, I could keep you here for hours, but <laughs> I wanted to also talk about the Enneagram system. I know you incorporate in your coaching. Tell us a little bit more. What is the Enneagram system and how do you use it? Oh, I, so I love the Enneagram. It's always been something that's in the peripheral that I've been interested in. And um, last year added it into my repertoire of like coaching tools. But what I love about it is it actually is a framework that helps us understand what are our underlying motivations. And from that, how do those motivations then manifest into like what we do, why we do what we do? So it's different from other frameworks in that like Myers-Briggs or a DISC assessment or Strengths Finder, they kind of tend to like say type you and this is who you are versus this really gets at what's under that. So not just, okay, are you introverted or extroverted? But why, like what, what was going on for you as a child or in your upbringing or a learn something that you learned as a strategy to help you make it through the world? Mm -hmm. And then what is it giving you and what is it costing you? Mm -hmm. And then the framework of the model itself is just so elegant and beautiful because it, it helps to also say, here's a mirror mirroring back these unconscious or subconscious beliefs that are driving you to do the things you do. And based on what you see, it also then becomes a map. So you can look at it and say, okay, where might be a place that I could stretch myself? What would be, what would it be to grow and to try on another strategy from a different type? I'm like pointing around like the circle. (laughs) Um, just to help you gain more tools in your toolbox to get out of um, the subconscious and really into a place of choice. I'm showing up the way that I want to show up. So as an example, I have a strong three and three is driven by this need for success. And so, yeah, I'm very driven and I, I know how to GSD left and right, and I don't want (laughs) to fail. And so in my career, that really, really helped me uh, because I had a really successful corporate career for nearly 15 years. But where it potentially got in the way was I stayed in a very like, I was happy with it, but I stayed in a very like comfortable, predictable kind of lane. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I was that big of a risk taker because I don't want to fail and look bad. And so now knowing that, how do I use that to help me, but then how do I recognize when it's starting to run me? Like, oh, I need to be successful and go do, 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 do. Okay, actually, I don't need to do that right now. I'm gonna borrow from like one of the other, um, like a wing or another line from the model and, mm-hmm. and try something new on and just kind of let that achiever have a little break. Mm. So it's, um, it's been a really powerful tool for, it's just another lens through which you can look at yourself, get to know yourself better and be out of the unconscious and into conscious choice with how you're showing up and how you're living your life. Another tool in your, tool. yeah. Is it, do, you, do we ever change anagrams? I think we have our home base. Mm-hmm. Because I think these motivations and drivers are just, part of us but I think as we evolve and we learn and we expand our self-awareness we have we can access all parts on the Enneagram and so we're never that's what I like about it we're never one thing um we have they would call, we call it a tri-type so there's um typically like some of some of the assessment that I use you'll see that you actually have like, you have your three, you have your primary home base and you have other two types that make up your three. And 
from that, you can kind of borrow from the different ink from the different numbers around the circle. And at some point, based upon like what might be going on, one of those in your tri-type might become more dominant because of the circumstantial like things going on. But ultimately we have we have our home base. So it might flex and change, but I think it's pretty stable. That's pretty cool. And especially with when you realize certain things of yourself and you may be unconditioned. That's why I was curious, like if you unconditioned, I don't think that would exactly change your anagram, but it would just bring more awareness, which is the point of everything. Just stop living in autopilot. Yeah. To be at choice. To be at choice. Yes. It's so powerful to know that you have a choice, but sometimes you're not conscious of it because I've heard, I've heard people that says, you know, telling people that stress is a choice is actually, it's not nice and not everybody can control their stress. And I agree, like there are things you can control and there are things you can't, if that made any sense. Yeah. I mean, stress is a natural human experience and it's wired in us for survival. Yeah. And there's practices that you can bring into your life to help better manage that stress and tell you, is this real stress? Like, is there a saber toothed tiger coming to attack me? (laughs) (laughs) Or, you know, our brain doesn't know the difference. And so just having tools and strategies to be able to manage when the stress like really flares up, how do you calm your cortisol levels so that you can be back into a place of choice? Yes. Yes. It's really just having the tools to come back. Simple. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And I think nowadays we have so many triggering stimulants around us because I think you know a lot of people are hitting another burnout wall because they've been isolated depending on where they are in the world and it's frustrated because you don't you're not living the way you used to and we're grieving and all of that on top of the layers they feel frustrated that they're burning out at home Mm -hmm. but it makes so much sense if you think about it because we're living almost the same days every day and we're limiting to interactions with a screen yes getting better but yeah it's real it's really real and so normalizing that for people yeah definitely um well and I don't know we have time to talk a little bit about yoga and how it's changed your life I know you love it a lot how do you (laughs) incorporate it in your coaching as well and and what Mm -hmm. you do every day I think the gift of yoga in terms of my, the work that I do as a coach for myself, it just gives me a way to stay centered and grounded and take care of me so that I can be in a good place in service of the people I coach and I lead. Mm -hmm. So it is so integral for me, just my, like I am the tool in my business. So I have to take care of myself and it's something that I've like brought back in in the last two months and it's just such a healing practice. And then I think in terms of like the coaching work, I like to borrow some of the philosophy of yoga and, and like the breath work in when I'm working with clients. So something as simple as like, let's just take a couple deep breaths together to like land or, you know, in yoga, we talk about the five causes of suffering. So like attachment and diversion, like what are you pushing away from? What are you clinging on to? Like those are two big sources of all human suffering. And so I might not say, you know, the, the all, I'm going to bring in some yoga philosophy. Right, right. You just, (laughs) you know, it just becomes a part of what you're embodying. Yeah. Yeah. And offering just, um, a chance for, for folks to take a moment to like what centers you. And for me, this is how I use yoga to get present, to be more aware and, and take care of myself. And so what's something for you and not letting people off the hook, you know, like, you know, you need to take care of yourself. So what, 
what is that way that you're going to take care of yourself? I mean, we all know what we need to do. Sleep, (laughs) move our body, drink water, eat mostly good. Don't binge watch TV all day, every day. Like, what are you doing to take care of yourself? It's not complicated. Mm -hmm. And so even going back to where we started our conversation, if it is yoga or running or something, it's not going to be how it was a year and a half ago. So what's some, what's a small thing you can do for you today? That's just going to help you start to fill your cup back up. So my practice shows me like all the places that I'm pushing too hard, not pushing enough, like where I need to slow down and where I need to practice a little bit more kindness to myself, to others. And I offer that to the people that I work with. That's beautiful. I loved, I treasure this conversation so much and I can go for hours. But (laughs) one of the things that I really love about you, Kristen, is that you're so good at just holding space. Like from the first couple of times we met, you're, I can feel your whole presence. You're there and you're just here to hold space. You're not here to judge or do anything. You're just there. So I appreciate it. Anybody who gets a chance to work with you, they're, they're lucky. Thank you so much. Well, I wanted to wrap this up with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? All right. Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) What's the best compliment you've ever received? Mm. I think when my kiddos say you're the best mom, Mm -hmm. it just melts my heart. And I think from a client, you know, their acknowledgement that our work and the way that I've held space for them and loved on them and seen them through their challenges and their growth has really been a great source of support for them changing and creating the life that they want. Like knowing the work I do makes a difference in their life. Yeah. Yeah. A book that's changed your life. Brene Brown, Gifts of Imperfection. She normalized all that crazy stuff going on and just gave a pathway to let go and some really practical tools to help manage some of that. I love love Brene Brown. Yeah. We should start a fan club. (laughs) (laughs) One of the many. (laughs) Yeah. What does coming home to yourself mean to you? Hmm. It means getting quiet to really tap into that wise, spiritual, intuitive self and letting that voice lead the way. What would you like more of? Mm. Fun and beach days. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Any advice or words for your younger self? Hmm. It's interesting to think about that one, but I think ultimately I would tell my younger self to trust yourself. It's all going to work out beautifully. Where can people find you? Hmm. We have a website, so kristinescavius.com. And occasionally, I've been a little bit quiet on social media, but I have an Instagram for my um, coaching business. So Courageous Growth Coaching. I believe that's the handle. <laughs> I'm quiet on I, I social found media you. I like found you the months. other day. I will find you and I will link it. We'll put it in the notes. <laughs> yeah, we'll put it in the notes. What are some offers or programs you have or wait lists that we can get on? Yeah. Uh, Oh, I'll say find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active and responsive on LinkedIn. So that's probably a great place to find me. Um, But in terms of the work that I'm doing right now, I'm taking on, I have a couple spots for one-on-one clients. So I typically work with folks for about six months and get to do one-on-one coaching and help you create the life that you really want. And then I also do work inside organizations. So if there's teams that are wanting to do team building, how to handle um, critical conversations or 
develop a stronger sense of trust, um, all sorts of different things. I work with leaders to create custom programs to bring to their teams. And then this fall, I'll have some new group coaching work coming. So stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned. Thank you so much, Kristen. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so good to spend this time with you. You're such a bright light in this world. And I just love your kindness and your sweetheart and the way that you bring so much mm -hmm. compassion into the way you show up. So thank you for having me. Thank you. That was unexpected. <laughs> thank you for this nourishing afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.